Hello and welcome to this new episode. Within this episode, I'm going to talk about burial mounds, their connection to the elves, fairies and ancestors. Where finally, I also go into the ancestors in connection to the concept of Hamingya and the Proto-Indo-European ritual practice regarding burial mounds as a place of connection to the ancestors and the gods. Some of this information presented here also comes from my new book Alchemy of the Psyche, link in the description, that goes deeper into the Proto-Indo-European Chorios, the figure Holda, and her connection to the sovereignty goddess. Both a Neolithic wolf and bear cult in that sense. So now coming to the episode itself. For those who do not know, uh, Tumalus, commonly known as a barrow or burial mound, represents a raised structure crafted from earth and stones, serving as a commemorative structure over one or more graves. This term is widely employed with similar structures known as kurgans in Siberia and Central Asia. These spread throughout Europe, for instance, but also throughout the world at large. As you can see here on this map, there are many such sites that have been already found within Europe. These are generally the burial place of those who died, such as, you know, beloved warriors or kings or other important figures of the tribe. But also being places with connections to the ancestors. The latter being the part which we will focus on. In the realm of Norse pre-Christian burial traditions, the burial mound emerges as a distinctive feature. Scandinavia boasts numerous such mounds, each distinguished by its unique size and structure. Notable examples include the Viking Age mounds at Borer in Norway and the imposing North Mount at Jelling. Larger mounds such as Anundshog in Sweden and Ragnarhaugen in Norway likely predate the Viking Age, showcasing the evolution of burial practices over time. The construction of burial mounds wasn't also confined solely to the Norse. In Britain, during the Neolithic and Bronze Ages, earlier communities erected barrows for burial purposes as well. Interestingly, the Anglo-Saxons later repurposed these barrows, you know, underscoring the continuity of these burial practices across, you know, diverse cultures and ethnic groups during prehistoric and early medieval Europe. You know, when the Anglo-Saxon society existed within the Middle Ages, such burials were not restricted to any one cultural or ethnic group, with Germanic-speaking, Slavic-speaking and Celtic-speaking peoples of the period you know, within Europe all taking part in such a burial practice for elite members of their societies, containing many lavish gifts such as cauldrons, swords, wagons and many more items for the other world. Where in Irish folklore, the hills or tumuli are known as Side. The modern Irish term is Si, while in Scottish Gaelic it is Sith. In Old Irish it is Side, and the singular form is Sith. It's noteworthy that the term Side is sometimes misapplied to both the mounts and the enchanting beings associated with them. But... David Fitzgerald speculated that the word Sid was synonymous with immortal as compared with other words meaning they wait, remain, lasting, perpetual and long life. And within Irish tradition, the Ishi are intricately linked with the Sida and are revered and appeased through offerings in folk belief and practice. These mystical Entities are often referred to as the good neighbors, the fair folk, or simply the folk. The terms Ishi, Ishida, Dawin Sida, and Dawin Sith are all words signifying people of the mounts, 
directly connecting that to the Sida. And these beings, described as both stunningly beautiful and capable of fierceness, assume the role of guardians over their abodes, which include also fairy hills, rings, trees, logs or woods. And it is believed that infringing on these spaces will cause the Ishii to retaliate in an effort to remove the people or objects that invaded their homes. With many of these tales contributing to the changeling myth in West European folklore, with the Ishii kidnapping trespassers or replacing their children with changelings as a punishment for transgressing. Further, the Ishii are believed to have a close connection to specific times and events. They are thought to be more accessible during dusk and dawn, aligning with the belief that the Gaelic Otherworld draws nearer to the mortal world at these times. Where festivals like Samhain, Beltane and Midsummer are particularly associated with encounters with the Ishi. And in many Gaelic tales, the Ishi are later literary versions of the Tuatha Danann, people of the goddess Danu, the deities and deified ancestors of Irish mythology. Some sources describe them as the survivors of the Tuatha Danann who retreated into the other world, and they are said to have come to Ireland as conquerors, defeating the previous inhabitants of the island and establishing their rule regarding the Tuatha Danann, who are also associated with the elements of nature, particularly with the sky, earth and underworld, and they were believed to have control over the elements and the forces of nature. And they dwell in the other world but were said to enter into the human world. They were also associated with the ancient burial mounds, which were then Ancient Celts were entrances to the other world, where the Tuatadan have been also linked to the Proto-Indo-European Chorios, as both are considered to be groups of supernatural beings who possess powerful magic and wisdom. However, the exact relationship between the two is still a matter of debate among scholars. Some suggest that the Tuatadan are a remnant of an ancient Indo-European culture that migrated to Ireland, while others believe that they are a unique creation of Irish mythology, with no direct connection to other Indo-European cultures. In either case, the Tuatha Danann and the Chorios share many similarities in terms of their cultural and religious practices, suggesting a common origin or influence. The Tuatha Dé, meaning tribe of the gods, eventually, however, became the fairies. Such fairies, as much as the Tuatha Danann, are connected to burial mounds. This also is common in, for instance, Scandinavian mythology regarding elves and also within Iceland with their own version of elves called Alla Gabletter. These are, for the Icelandic people, also associated with the hidden people often referred to as the Holdu folk. Both of these are often connected to fertility, but also with burial mounds. Also connected to the term Huldra, which similarly means secret or covered, which is connected to the figure Holda. In Sweden, when it comes to the Holdra, the um, phenomena is also linked to Odin's hunt, during which Odin is said to transform into an ancient king or chief. According to belief, Odin would take on the form of a horseman, accompanied by his dogs, leading a spectral entourage of otherworldly beings and the souls of the departed. Where there is also an ancient rite where the men of the proto indo european Chorus warrior troop would embody their ancestors before becoming part of the tribe which predates these myths about Odin and the Wild Hunt, going back to the Neolithic. In various Scandinavian tales, Odin, as this horseman, would be observed chasing the Holdra or Holder, also called Skogsrat, ruler of the forest, or Skogsfrun, lady of the forest, 
traversing forests and, you know, spanning the skies. Similarly, in northern Germany, the pursuit and capture of female demons were also recurrent themes. The linked holder is one of several Ra, which means a warden of particular places. In the ancient animistic sense, it was important for people to cultivate good relations with these type of spirits, since they had power over natural forces and animals under their care and could cause both good and bad luck for humans who interfered with the places and creatures under their watch. What we can see then also is that the Tuatha Danann are seen as the distant ancestors as much as they became the fairies both linked to burial mounds, as much as there is a general connection between fairies, ancestors and the burial mounds. Other figures of importance in Norse mythology that can be mentioned here are the Dísir, who are connected to deities like Freya. The term Dísir originates from Old Norse language, where Dís, plural Dísir, translates roughly as lady or goddess. In some texts they are depicted as individual goddesses or supernatural entities, while in others they are presented as ancestral spirits, often tied to the lineage of a particular family or clan. One of the primary roles of the Dísir was to act as protectors and guardians of family lineages. As ancestral spirits they were intimately tied to the welfare of their descendants. The Dísir watched over their families, protecting them from harm ensuring their prosperity and guiding them through life's difficulties. The Dísir were also honored during the annual festival known as Dísablöð. Held at the beginning of winter, this festival involved elaborate sacrifices and feasting. The purpose of this ritual was to seek the Dísir's blessings for the coming year. What is then also important to talk about within this context is the idea of ancestor worship that is intimately tied to what we talked about as well. Animistic ancestor worship is the foundation for many of these beliefs when it comes to the burial mounds, as much as when it comes to ancestral spirits or other linked beings. In hunter-gatherer societies, ancestor worship is often based on the belief that the ancestors continue to exist in a spiritual realm and can influence the lives of the living. Ancestors, such as the Norse Dísir, are seen as important sources of knowledge, wisdom and protection, and they are believed to have a special connection with their living descendants. In some societies, ancestors, which includes humans, plants and animals, are also believed to have the power to intervene in the affairs of the living, either for good or for ill. Hunter-gatherer ancestor worship can take many different forms depending on the specific cultural context. It may involve offerings of food or drinks, holding a communal feast, or offering other items to the ancestors as well as the performance of rituals or ceremonies designed to honor and communicate with them. Ancestors may also be invoked in times of crisis or need, such as during illness or times of war. In shamanic ancestor worship, the focus is often on communicating with the spirits of ancestors for the purpose of gaining guidance, wisdom or healing. Shamanic practitioners may use various methods to connect with ancestral spirits, including meditation, trance states, and the use of psychoactive plants. Where they also may create altars or other sacred spaces dedicated to the ancestors. And they may perform rituals or ceremonies to honor and communicate with them, you know, using these particular sacred altars. But in any case, in both hunter-gatherer ancestor worship and shamanic ancestor worship, the focus is on maintaining a connection with the spiritual realm and the wisdom and guidance of the ancestors. 
And in that sense, these practices can help individuals to gain a greater understanding of their place in the world and their relationship with their ancestors and the natural environment. In Jungian psychology, ancestors you know, can be seen as symbolic representations of the collective unconscious. The collective unconscious being the universal storehouse of images, symbols and archetypes that are shared by all human beings. And these archetypes can be seen in various forms, including mythological figures, symbols and cultural practices, including ancestor worship. But when it now comes to the connection with the ancestors, a particular Norse term I want to bring up right now is Hamingya. When it comes to the connection with the ancestors, which is of importance when it comes to Norse culture. So, Hamingya is a Norse term that can be loosely translated as luck, power or fortune, but it encompasses much more than mere luck. It basically represents a person's accumulated power and energy from their ancestors, their lineage and their actions. And it's a concept deeply tied to one's heritage and the idea that the wisdom, strength and experiences of ancestors continue to influence and guide individuals in the present. Hamingya as a concept is also deeply tied to one's family lineage in Norse culture as well. It represents the collective power and energy of all the ancestors within a family's bloodline. It is inherited from one's forebears and each generation contributes to it. And it is also not something static, but rather a dynamic and evolving force that carries the experiences, wisdom and deeds of those who came before. Hamingya can come from various sources in the family, including notable ancestors, heroes, or particularly influential family members. Therefore, not all family members may share exactly the same amount. Next to this, it is considered a guiding and protective force. It influences the actions and decisions of an individual, helping them navigate life's challenges. It's often seen as a guardian spirit within the family as well. And as this ancestral spirit, it watches over the family and its members, providing support in times of need and acting as a protector. And this spirit infuses individuals with strength, resilience and determination next to serving as a wellspring of courage, insight and inner power. The concept of Hamingya is also then often intertwined with the idea of an ancestral guardian spirit, which are often linked to totem animals as well. The qualities and characteristics of these guardian spirits are connected to the Hamingya's influence, meaning that the form of the guardian spirit is influenced by the exact nature of one's Hamingya. As such, a person's or family's Hamingya reveals a lot about their personal and ancestral character. And individuals may also perform rituals and practices to strengthen their connection with their ancestral guardian spirit as well. And these practices aim to ensure that the guardian spirit's influence and wisdom are continually accessible. As this spirit and the connected Hamingya is passed down through generations, it links the living with the ancestral past, creating a sense of connection with one's roots. And by connecting with one's Hamingya, individuals can tap into the wisdom and knowledge of their ancestors. In that sense, when the person feels a heightened sense of wisdom and clarity while connected to, let's say, an ancestral stag spirit, one is essentially tapping into this reservoir of Hamingya. And speaking from experience here, if one is cut off from one's Hamingya, it feels like being cut off from not only one's sense of spiritual power, but also spiritual wisdom. When it then also now comes to both ancestor worship and the concept of Hamingya, it can be seen from a union lens as a way of connecting with and tapping into the collective unconscious. By 
honoring and communicating with the spirits of deceased ancestors. Individuals can access the wisdom and guidance that is embedded in the collective unconscious. The ancestors can be thus seen as archetypal figures that embody specific qualities or characteristics that are desirable or needed, such as wisdom, protection or healing. In addition, ancestor worship within both the animistic context and a union context can be seen as a way of maintaining a connection with the past and with one's cultural roots. Ancestral figures for animistic cultures can also serve as guides or role models, providing a sense of continuity and tradition that can be grounding and stabilizing. In that sense, the enduring nature of such practices is then also precisely due to their nature of creating this connection between the past and the present, whilst bringing together the community. Burial mounds then also played an important part in this, as a place where people would connect to their ancestors, especially you know within a European context that we're talking about uh, right now. But also outside of it, it uh, also played such roles as well, where such practices uh, regarding burial were practiced. But to fully understand this type of practice, we need to place it into its ancient Proto-Indo-European context. Their you know, spiritual beliefs were animistic and polytheistic when it comes to the Proto-Indo-Europeans. With their Religious practices revolving around sacrificial rites involving cattle and horses, likely overseen by a class of priests or quote-unquote shamans. These rituals involved the slaughter of animals dedicated to the gods. Now when it comes to such ritualistic practices, they contain specific altar spaces to specific ones meant for different purposes. In the western direction, a circular altar symbolized the earth and family for them, while a square altar represented the sky and the gods. A parallel duality of shapes also existed in Greek and Roman tradition, where a round altar hosted the family hard fire, and rectangular altars were dedicated to offerings for the gods, where the Discovery of both square and round configurations of burnt stones and bones, likely serving as fire altars in Scandinavia's Bronze Age and Iron Age, further suggests a shared practice among cultures widely separated in the Indo-European world, thus hinting at the likelihood that Proto-Indo-Europeans conducted similar sacrificial rituals in comparable enclosures, possibly atop kurgans, so burial mounds. And the structures functioning as altars allowed families or clans to make offerings to both ancestors, the ancestral spirits, think these here, and the household's minor deities, such as those presiding over the yard, livestock, trees and groves, next to a place where the gods could be invoked. Where for the Proto-Indo-Europeans, you know, each act of sacrifice also served as a symbolic recreation of the world. In the Indo-European mythos, two primal beings are here important, being Manu and Yemu. The um, initial priest Manu sacrificed the first king, Yemu, who then assumed the role of Lord of the Dead. Participants in these sacrificial rites affirmed their shared ancestry, as it was believed that the first humans were formed from the dismembered parts of Yemu. As such, each birth was a reenactment of the primal elements uniting akin to the recreation of Yemu, while each death echoed the original dismemberment. As such, for the ancient Proto-Indo-European people, Burial mounds not only represented a place for the dead, but a great way to the other world, and with it to the gods. So, 
from a Jungian lens a connection to the archetypal energies both within us and without. I do want to add in the end that it is by reconnecting to these energies that we can reconnect to the foundations of ourselves, the instinctual foundations of ourselves as much as from a Jungian lens the collective unconscious and its archetypes, so we can move towards who we truly are. Archetypal symbols were, you know, deeply embedded in the cultural narratives, rituals and practices of these traditional societies. They served as a bridge between individuals and their cultural roots. Where archetypes further often functioned as shared symbols to united communities, offering a sense of continuity and shared identity. And from a Union perspective, you know, if we contrast that with modernity, the current superficial and distorted interpretation of these archetypes may not fulfill their potential to serve as transformative and integrative tools for you know both the individual and society when we're not talking about let's say the, the fairies, you know, the deeper connection that we now talked about regarding the ancestors. As such, you know, rather than fostering a meaningful connection to the unconscious and cultural heritage, such interpretations may risk contributing to a shallow or escapist engagement with these symbols. You know, when we take symbols like fairies or elves and we, you know, strip them of their cultural meaning and we take them solely as um, symbols of fantasy. And in that form, they can become symbols that entrance us and pull us into the unconscious in an ungrounded manner. As such, it is important to reconnect these archetypes to their essence, so to connect it back to their roots, as much as finding a way to bridge this with our own modern life. And as such, rituals are important, you know, containers for these archetypal energies that can focus them and give them a practical aspect that grounds them into the world. But with that said, I hope that with this video you learned something now regarding the essence of elves, fairies and ancestors and the ancient cultural foundations that underlie these, to give you thought on these beings and their deeper connections to the ancestors. Though, you know, there is of course much more to elves and fairies than this singular connection. They are as beings also intricately linked to trees, groves and nature as a whole. But with all that said, in the end, if you found this video insightful or want to learn uh, something more regarding anything in particular, let me know in the comments. And make sure to like and subscribe. And I would say thank you for watching.